Our speaker today, I think for most of us, needs no introduction, although I feel compelled to give him some introduction. I think it's safe to say that Dr. Hake is an original. <laughs> Your laughter suggests that you have had him in class and that you know that uh, there is no other like Dr. Hake. But in addition to his, his uh, unique teaching and his care for his students that I think is exemplary, Dr. Hake is also an original, for he is one who was here at the very beginning, Patrick Henry College, the first professor of literature. He is our senior man here on campus. He's been here from the beginning. And uh, in that sense, uh, he took a greater risk than maybe any of the rest of us coming to a little upstart venture in Northern Virginia, which now seems so well established that we even have, well, suited bodyguards at the uh, door during our lecture. <laughs> I think those of you who know Dr. Hake know him to be a man of wisdom and a man of prayer. I think we're all looking forward to what he has to say today, so please listen carefully to Dr. Hake as he comes to deliver this semester's Faith and Reason Lecture. Dr. Hake. Faith and Reason lectures are supposed to stretch us, to challenge us intellectually. I want to do this, but neither, neither do I want to lose you. I don't want you to be, as the Taiwanese say, ducks listening to thunder. Hence the outline in your hands. This should help you follow the overall path. If we're galloping along and you fall off your horse, simply go to the next point on the outline and wait for us there. In a few moments, we will have caught up with you, and you can get back on and rejoin us. Also, I want to give you substantial chunks of Derrida and Foucault, of Chomsky and Levi Strauss. But these were written not to be listened to, but to be read. So I have given you these direct quotations in your outlines. You can read them with me. Usually after I read the quotation, I will take some time to explain and unpack it. This also should help you follow. Next point in the outline. <clears throat> the last 500 years of Western history can be summed up in the proverb, pride goeth before destruction. For a variety of reasons, we in the West discarded our Christian faith and grew confident that we could save ourselves, that God was for children. We grew proud. We gave up our belief in the fall and, redemp and, and redemption and believed only in creation, as it were. This happened gradually during the Renaissance and Enlightenment, God began to shrink for the deists and soon disappeared altogether in the full-blown naturalism and materialism that is still all around us. There is no God, only time and chance and matter. We are alone in the universe. At first, this liberation from God seemed bracing good news. We are finally and absolutely free. But soon the real implications of this freedom this loneliness and lostness came home, and we began to despair. The confident promise of the enlightenment of modernism, that human reason and ingenuity, that science and technology and Isaac Newton could save us, proved false. Modern problems appeared much deeper and more intractable, even than ancient ones. We gave up our belief in creation and now believed only in the fall. We were siffers meaningless non-entities. We entered what James Sire called the foggy bottomland of nihilism. Our pride brought about a most painful fall. This pride goes before the fall pattern of the last 500 years has been reenacted in the last 50 or 60 years, even within my lifetime. David Richter has said recently, quote, cultural studies is the hegemonic critical discourse at the moment one that contains the humanities and social sciences collective response to what we might call the era of grand theory, the two decades beginning with the structuralist revolution in the 1960s. 
the era of grand theory produced a vital set of competing ideas about literature, society, and the mind, but failed to coalesce in any single new rationale for textual and literary study. The new criticism has been displaced and decentered, but nothing had taken its place. In its enormous variety and eclecticism, cultural studies is not so much a new paradigm of knowledge as a way of making do temporarily without a paradigm. This is to say that the confidence of modernists that we can save ourselves and that God is for children has played itself out again, and our postmodern culture is treading water, if not floundering. Pride has again given way to despair. The time is right for a Christian renaissance. I propose to show the many ways in which currently fashionable paradigms of knowledge are inadequate, and Christianity offers surprising and satisfying solutions to the problems they present. The new criticism Richter mentions was the dominant literary mindset in the West, and especially in America during the first half of the 20th century. This had its own deep problems, but in simple terms, it let texts speak for themselves and sought to explicate them. Many of its leading advocates were believers of some sort. Men like John Crow Ransom, Alan Tate, Cleanth Brooks, and the Southern Agrarians. One said, I do with poems what my daddy does with scripture every Sunday. I explore and explicate their meaning. While this movement or mindset was not necessarily truly Christian, it was easy for Christians to live within. Language had meaning. Truth was objective and accessible. Literature, whether a poem or the Bible, was comprehensible. Through the 50s, at least, a Christian college professor could operate quite comfortably within even our mainstream academic culture. This was broken up, Richter says, was displaced or decentered by the era of grand theory, and specifically the structuralist revolution in the 1960s. New criticism itself was a form of structuralism, and perhaps its true nature was shown by this revolution. This revolution can be described as a messianic confidence that the powerful analytical techniques of this approach could finally unlock the secrets of language and meaning and usher in the golden age, could take us to El Dorado, an earthly paradise. It can be thought of as a kind of last hurrah of modernism. The French literary critic Roland Barthes, a leading structuralist, published SZ in 1970, a 220-page commentary on Saracen, a minor story by Balzac. Richter says of this work that it was, quote, simultaneously the masterpiece and the reductio ad absurdum of high structuralism, because it made clear that any genuinely complete analysis of a fictional text would be so long and complex as to be nearly unreadable. It was widely admired, but never imitated, even by Bart himself. It was sterile, a dead end. God resists the proud and frustrates any Tower of Babel-like projects on our part to build a utopia apart from him. Evidently, Isaac Newton, a giant of the Enlightenment and early modern science, was baffled by the complexities of human language and the brain. Darwin, too, wondered how his theory, theory might account for the origin of language, this most remarkable and uniquely human phenomenon. Easily the greatest linguist of the 20th century, Noam Chomsky, professor of linguistics and philosophy at MIT, has been working for many decades, along with a huge cadre of linguists throughout the world, on this problem that baffled both Newton and Darwin. He believes that he has come close to finding that, quote, nature has, in Galileo's words, employed the least elaborate the simplest and easiest of means, but in a domain where this would hardly be expected, a very recent and apparently isolated product of evolution, a central component of the most complex organic object known, a component that is surely at the core of our mental nature, cultural achievement, and curious history. Understand what Chomsky is saying in this additional remarkable instance of what I called above the last hurrah of modernism. He is saying that the problem that baffled the genius of Isaac Newton, that temporarily derailed the locomotive of modernism, that prompted Descartes to involve us in mind-body dualism, that Darwin could not begin to account for, has been solved, or almost solved, by him and his army of linguists. Language, 
that recent isolated product of evolution, language, that central component of the most complex organic object known, the human brain, language, lying at the core of our mental nature, cultural achievement, and curious history, at the core of what we have come to call Western civilization, can be accounted for with Galilean simplicity and ease, an early ideal of modernism, even as Galileo accounted for astronomical phenomena with the simple and easy Copernican hypothesis that the Earth traveled around the sun and not vice versa, that language can be accounted for by Chomsky's theory of universal grammar. I do not want to minimize for a moment the very real and massive contributions that Chomsky and his fellow researchers have made to our understanding of how human language operates, but he has arrived at these insights by thoroughly exploring two hypotheses, that human language, at least originally, was perfect and was unified. But this, Christians have always believed. Chomsky has devoted his great gifts and his entire life to shoring up the modernistic Tower of Babel, ironic given the linguistic connection to Babel, but to showing, to showing that science, given time and patience, can account for everything without any talk of God. This is indeed a kind of linguistic genome project, a kind of linguistic toe or theory of everything. And yet, far from toppling faith in God, his findings make even more sense given a Christian understanding of language and origins, that language, at least originally, was perfect and was unified. I want to give one more example of what Richter called the structuralist revolution of the 1960s, and what I have called the last hurrah of modernism. At the very epicenter of this revolution was the French anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss and his work on comparative mythologies. He applied his methods to mythologies because he believed this to be the highest form of language. Quote, myth is language functioning on an especially high level where meaning succeeds practically at taking off from the linguistic ground on which it keeps rolling. After explaining his method, he gives, us a concrete he gives us a concrete example, an analysis of the many versions of the Oedipus myth. He concludes in this way, quote, Turning back to the Oedipus myth, we may now see what it means. The myth has to do with the inability for a culture which holds the belief that mankind is autochthonous, born of the earth, to find a satisfactory transition between this theory and the knowledge that human beings are actually born from the union of man and woman. Although the problem obviously cannot be solved, the Oedipus myth provides a kind of logical tool which relates the, origin, the original problem, born from one or born from two, to the derivative problem, born from different or born from same. Again, this most sophisticated result of structuralist research makes perfect sense in the light of scripture. We know that we are both born from one and born from two, both born from different and born from same. Adam's body was from the earth, and his soul breathed into him from God. Eve was taken from Adam, and all of us have come from these, our first parents, though God is just as much our creator as theirs. Paul applies this to our relative interdependence as men and women and our absolute dependence on God in 1 Corinthians 11. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. This is beautifully balanced, clear, and practically helpful. Levi Struess sees myth as the highest form of language, language almost taking off in his airplane metaphor quoted above. Yet scripture is divine human language incarnational language, language whose primary author is God himself and whose secondary authors are human beings. It is language which the, which the Spirit of God enables to take off and soar infinitely far beyond what any of its human authors could produce on his own. Levi Struess says elsewhere that, quote, there is no single true version of myth of which all the others are but copies or distortions. Every version belongs to the myth, unquote. Yet, if the Bible is what it claims to be, then it does indeed give us an infallible gold standard against which to measure all other accounts. It gives us the surest form of knowledge.
This segues naturally to the second phase of the era of grand theory of the 60s and 70s, and that is post-structuralism, post-modernism, or deconstruction. Pride, unless there is genuine repentance, leads inevitably to a fall, to destruction, to despair. The Martin Luther of post-modernity was the French philosopher Jacques Derrida. The 95 Theses, at least in America, was probably his contribution to a structuralist conference at Johns Hopkins University in 1966, a paper called Structure, Sign, and Play in the Discourse of the Human Sciences. Derrida is a bloodhound that begins to bay any time he catches even a whiff of God. In a sense, Derrida was inevitable. In the West, we did not want God, but we also did not want the consequences of not having God. God set be sets before us only two alternatives, life or death. There is no third or fourth way, ultimately, though sinful man is constantly trying to invent or imagine one. The way of life, according to the Bible, is the way toward God, for God is life. Death is running from God. Sinners want life but do not want God. This can never be. And the only way to God is through the cross and the gospel repentance, and faith. The modernists, all the way through Levi-Strauss, Chomsky, and Bart, definitely did not want God, but still believed they could have all the blessings of God, like meaning and purpose and understanding. Derrida simply said, in effect, we believe there is no God. Let us face some of the implications of that belief. Without going into unnecessary detail, I want to share with you a few specifics from this essay. This rope was long enough to hang an entire civilization, in the words of James Sire. It moved Nietzsche from a kind of voice of one crying in the wilderness to the very center of our culture and showed us clearly that the emperor had no clothes. Derrida cites three Germans as his predecessors. Quote, The Nietzschean critique of metaphysics, the critique of the concepts of being and truth, for which were substituted the concepts of play, interpretation, and sign, sign without truth present. The Freudian critique of self-presence, that is, the critique of consciousness, of the subject, of self-identity, and of self-proximity or self-possession. And, more radically, the Heideggerian destruction of metaphysics, of ontotheology, of the determination of being as presence. Derrida begins by attacking the very idea of structure, this was a structuralist conference, of center, of presence. Quote, this is why one could perhaps say that the movement of any archaeology, like that of any eschatology, is an accomplice of this reduction of the structurality of structure and always attempts to conceive of structure from the basis of a full presence which is out of play. Archaeology, the beginning of something, and eschatology, the end of something, both imply some kind of absolute fixed reference point, some kind of full presence. God, in other words. But this is out of play, cheating, a no-no. If we don't believe in God, we can't really talk about centers, about presence, about structures, and mean anything by them. In this way, too, everything becomes discourse, becomes text. Think of Derrida's famous aphorism, there is nothing outside the text. The, ab quote, the absence of of the transcendental signified extends the domain and the interplay of signification ad infinitum, unquote. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you see, is the transcendental signified, capital T, capital S. He is the source and center of everything, including language. Language works and is wonderful because of God. Take him away and you are left with a sea of words, all of which relate to each other but none of which relate to anything ultimate, even to anything real. This is where the word virtual becomes scary. This is the ultimate hypertext. We are quite literally lost in the funhouse, chasing, endlessly chasing reflections of reflections of reflections. Derrida is using the gifts of God to shoot at him, waging a kind of metaphysical guerrilla warfare, a kind of cosmic terrorism. This is what sinners always do but he has taken it to a whole new level of sophistication and importance.
He engages Levi Struess in some detail because he represents modernism or structuralism in its most impressive form. He says, quote, Levi Struess thinks that in this way he can separate method from truth, the instruments of the method and the objective significations aimed at by it, unquote. Levi Struess wants the benefits of theism without the burdens, the perks without the responsibilities. He's honest enough to recognize that the linguistic plane doesn't ever really take off, but he speaks as though it does. Derrida says that Levi Struess's own books constitute a kind of mythology, a kind of wishful thinking. He's whistling in the dark. Jake Barnes, the narrator in Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, reflects in the middle of the night, quote, I did not care what it was all about. All I wanted to know was how to live in it. Maybe if you found out how to live in it, you learned from that what it was all about, unquote. But you cannot have ethics without metaphysics. You cannot derive metaphysics from ethics. Law is not enough. We need the gospel. Listen to Levi Struess on the origin of language as quoted by Derrida. Quote, whatever may have been the moment and the circumstances of its appearance in the scale of animal life, language could only have been born in one fell swoop. Things could not have set about signifying progressively. Following a transformation, the study of which is not the concern of the social sciences, but rather of biology and psychology, a crossing over came about from a stage where nothing had meaning to another where everything possessed it, unquote. Buck passing 101. This takes even Derrida's breath away, a kind of linguistic big bang. Think of the problems posed by DNA and the huge amount of information presupposed by life as we know it. No wonder both Newton and Darwin were baffled by this. Derrida says that we must let go of language per se, of meaning and any dependable referentiality, and recognize only text. Chomsky might think he has answered or is answering Derrida, but he doesn't even engage the really fundamental questions. The Big Bang makes perfect sense to us as believers. That one moment there was no universe and the next moment there was. And the gift of language makes perfect sense to us. That one moment it did not exist on earth and the next moment it did because we believe in a God who created the universe even in a moment by his speech and who created us in his image and gave us this marvelous gift of speech. Neither Levi Struess nor Chomsky has even begun to appreciate the impossibility of either the Big Bang or the existence of speech apart from God. Derrida, towards the end of his essay, states what might be called his postmodern gospel in which he says that his nihilism along with that of Nietzsche, is a joyful affirmation of freedom. But, as mentioned earlier, this only works for a little while and on sunny mornings. He ends on a far different note. Quote, Here there is a sort of question, call it historical, of which we are only glimpsing today the conception, the formation, the gestation, the labor. I employ these words, I admit, with a glance toward the business of childbearing, but also with a glance toward those who, in a company from which I do not exclude myself, turn their eyes away in the face of the as yet unnameable, which is proclaiming itself, and which can do so, as is necessary, whenever a birth is in the offing, only under the species of the non-species, in the formless, mute, infant, and terrifying form of monstrosity." This reminds me very strongly of Yeats's brilliant poem, The Second Coming, and its vivid picture of cultural despair. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun, is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. 
the darkness drops again. But now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Pride has led again to despair. This one-two punch of pride and despair then gave us what Richter described earlier as the, quote, vital set of competing ideas about literature, society, and the mind that failed to coalesce in any single new rationale for textual and literary study, unquote. Pride and despair can never coalesce into anything helpful. We cannot live without hope and meaning, and so we will exhaust ourselves trying to manufacture them somehow. The currently hegemonic, the now dominant, amorphous grab bag of cultural studies contains many such attempts. Travis Timmons, one of our earliest lit grads, emailed me a couple years ago during, during his first year in grad school. He was taking a lit class on the Frankfurt School. His professor said on the first day of class, postmodernism is dead. We need an idea. She proposed to return to the Frankfurt School for the needed idea. Richter himself, after surveying many options very thoroughly, confesses that he thinks postmodern despair was premature and that the Frankfurt School of Urbane Marxism is still very attractive. Indeed, Marx and Freud still cast very long shadows over our intellectual and cultural world, though they are merely other names for pride and despair. Jürgen Habermas is a central figure in the Frankfurt School, perhaps the leading social philosopher in Germany and the Marxist most quoted by liberal humanists. He advocates what could be called a chastened modernism. I would like to share with you the last part of a very revealing footnote that came at the end of his essay, The Philosophical Discourse of Modernity. Quote, With this kind of fallibilism, we, philosophers and non-philosophers alike, do not by any means eschew truth claims. Such claims cannot be raised in the performative attitude of the first person other than as transcending space and time, precisely as claims. But we are also aware that there is no zero context for truth claims. They are raised here and now and are open to criticism. Hence, we reckon upon the trivial possibility that they will be revised tomorrow or someplace else. Just as it always has, philosophy understands itself as a defender of rationality in the sense of the claim of reason endogenous to our form of life. In its work, however, it prefers a combination of strong propositions with weak status claims. So little is this totalitarian that there is no call for a totalizing critique of reason against it. Again, let me briefly unpack this. This might be called a chastened modernism, a kinder and gentler Marxism. Marx and Engels were science and history, economics and politics, hard-hitting and confident. Habermas and the Frankfurt School are reasonable, literary, given to scholarly qualifications. This is Marxism after Antonio Gramsci, the Italian who discovered the importance of the, an indirect culture-shaping agenda for Marxism. Indeed, according to the Team 2B report sent to PHC faculty a few months ago by Colonel Middleton, Muslims are also well aware of this strategy and are pursuing it very effectively under our noses. In a sense, PHC's own culture-shaping mission is an instance of this as we seek to be salt and light and leaven in our dark and rotting world. The difference, of course, is that we are leading people back to God and truth rather than taking them in the opposite direction. Habermas is saying, in effect, we are fallible and recognize it. Sure, we make truth claims. Everybody does. But we realize there is no zero context for them, no word of God to appeal to or base them upon. Even Marx was a mere man. We appeal to reason, but not to something absolute and objective, but rather something endogenous to our form of life, something that has grown up not from above, but from below, not from without, but from within, not from God but merely human. Here's the key, the clincher. Strong propositions with weak status claims. This is sounding a lot like Levi Strauss's. Levi Strauss. Sure, we talk like the plane is flying, but we know it is not, in fact. It sounds like the Wizard of Oz. Mighty language, but don't peek behind the curtain. One wonders what the authors of the Communist Manifesto would have thought of these weasel words. Quote, so little is this totalitarian 
that there is no call for a totalizing critique against it, unquote. Habermas is attempting to dodge Derrida's nuclear warheads, but you cannot have urbane, reasonable discourse without absolute truth. The academic dean at St. John's University complained a few years ago in a State of the College report, we have two groups of radicals on campus, those who are devoted to Nietzsche and an even larger group who want to take the Bible very seriously. To his classical, moderate, balanced, and reasonable way of thinking, both these groups were undesirable. But God doesn't give us a third middle way. Ultimately, we must choose. Either Jesus was God or he was a madman. I said earlier that Freud, though still largely influential in the 21st century, is another form of despair. I will show you how in three ways. The first might be described as our loss of self, of identity. Derrida appealed to Freud's radical critique of, quote, self-presence, that is, the critique of consciousness of the subject of self-identity and of self-proximity or self-possession, unquote. I want to give you a better sense of how serious this is. For many centuries in the West, our sense of ourselves and our identity was deeply grounded in the Bible's doctrine that we are created in God's image and likeness, body and soul. The Bible refers to our soul, mind, essence as our heart. Even though we corrupt ourselves morally by rebelling against God, we do not cease to exist ontologically. Even sinners will be raised and suffer eternally. Our identity as individual, responsible selves is frighteningly certain. Though men call mountains to fall on them, they cannot hide themselves from the wrath of the Lamb, from the final judgment of each thought, word, and deed before the great white throne of God. Uh, though the, through the gospel, this profound sense of our individual, eternal existence is experienced as a wonderful thing in Psalm 139. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Perhaps the clearest indication in the Bible that we will always exist as our own unique eternal selves is Revelation 2.17. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Indeed, the very hairs of our head are numbered. The pride of modernity uh, gave us autonomous individualism, which is a root of many of our woes. But the despair of postmodernism is even worse. Freud, as noted above, denied our eternal existence as souls created in the image of God and understood us rather as egos. While I cannot unpack the Freudian ego in detail, it is a far cry even from the modern individual. It is a temporary site of negotiation between the superego and the id, a kind of very tentative tightrope walk. The French Freudian Jacques Lacan made this even more obvious. Lacan dragged Freud into Derrida's postmodern world where everything is language. Richter explains, quote, In treating the unconscious as a language rather than a polity, Lacan eliminates the notion of the ego as a homunculus, or little human being, inside ourselves, constantly defending itself against the depredations of the id. What he leaves in its place is far less solid and reified. The ego is an imaginary construct, a false image of identity and wholeness. But the ego is less important to Lacan than the subject, and the subject is simply the fluid position from which an I speaks and the signification of desire takes place. The subject is not entirely effaced, but it is decentered from a privileged spot to that of a function of language." Unquote. Note the clear direction here. We are far less solid and reified. We do not really exist. We are an imaginary construct, a false image of identity and wholeness, but it gets much, gets, but it gets much worse. We are not even egos in this much weakened, attenuated sense. We are simply subjects, the fluid position from which an I speaks in the phrase, I desire. The subject is not effaced, rubbed out completely, but it is decentered, that word again, from a privileged spot to that of a function of language. We have gone from image bearers of Almighty God who will be judged by every idle word we speak to the thing that comes before the verb to make the sentence complete. Does it seem to you like someone is running here? 
Someone is calling linguistic mountains to cover him and hide him from the face of the one with whom he had to do. A student of Lacan and a literary titan whose influence rivals even that of Derrida is Michel Foucault. He begins and ends one of his most famous essays, The Death of, an, of the Author, by quoting Samuel Beckett, the Irish playwright and author of Waiting for Godot. Quote, Beckett nicely formulates the theme with which I would like to begin. What does it matter who is speaking, someone said. What does it matter who is speaking? In this indifference appears one of the fundamental ethical principles of contemporary writing. Unquote. Does it matter who is speaking? If professors send students an email, we want it to get noticed and answered. But even emails from fellow students are from very important human beings. Didn't Jesus say something like, in listening to one of the least of these, my brothers, you were listening to me? There are no little people. And if God is speaking, it matters absolutely. Words matter because the persons speaking them matter. This is bedrock Christianity, and it has been so profoundly abandoned by our peers that it's almost incomprehensible. Some of you will recall C.S. Lewis's comments on the history of the word genius in the discarded image. Quote, from this class, an individual demon or genius, the standard Latin translation of demon, is allotted to each human being as his witness and guardian through life. It would detain us too long here to trace the steps whereby a man's genius, from being an invisible personal and external attendant, became his true self and then his cast of mind, and finally, among the romantics, his literary or artistic gifts. To understand this process fully would be to grasp that great movement of internalization and that consequent aggrandizement of man and desiccation of the outer universe in which the psychological history of the West has so largely consisted, unquote. He comes back to this towards the end of the book, quote, in this great change, something has been won and something lost. I take it to be part and parcel of, that, of the same great process of internalization which has turned genius from an attendant demon into a quality of the mind. Always, century by century, item after item is transfer, transferred from the object side of the account to the subjects. And now, in some extreme forms of behaviorism, the subject himself is discounted as merely subjective. We only think that we think. Having eaten up everything else, he eats himself up too. And where we go from that is a dark question, unquote. Foucault and Beckett might suggest where we go from that. Even Lewis, I think, would be amazed. The second way in which Freud brings despair is developed in a fascinating essay by the Freudian literary critic Peter Brooks called Freud's Master Plot. I welcome any of you to read any of the essays to which I'm referring in their entirety. They will not disappoint you. Brooks says that Freud's two most famous axioms, the pleasure principle and the death instinct, resolve into one ultimately. What brings us most pleasure is death. He quotes Jean-Paul Sartre on Stephen Covey's second habit, begin with the end in mind. I became my own obituary. All plot in literature is ultimately only a brief delay, an arabesque in the relentless drive toward the final goal, death. Hence, in Greek mythology, eros, love, embraces death. The famous choice of the three caskets in Shakespeare's Merchant of Venice also shows us this. Each man has to do with three women, his mother, his wife, and Mother Earth, the dust to which he returns. Not the gold or silver caskets held the desired image, image but the dull, leaden one. Bassanio was really choosing death. The primal unity that we recover in death is not that of Genesis 1 and 2, God and life, but rather that of Genesis 3, death. God's own comment on Freud might be, those who hate me love death, Proverbs 8, 36. And a final way in which Freud leaves us in despair is brought to us by Professor Hayden White. Professor White was, for a number of years since 1978, professor of the history of human consciousness at the University of California at Santa Cruz. If I held this position, I wouldn't dare open my mouth when I walked in the classroom. Maybe being in California would help. <laughs> Don't think that Professor White is lunatic fringe. He's a much-published, deeply respected, and very prominent intellectual leader in America today. 
The crux of his essay, The Politics of Historical Interpretation, is found in this passage. Quote, In my view, the theorists of the sublime had correctly divined that whatever dignity and freedom human beings could lay claim to could only come by way of what Freud called a reaction formation to an apperception of history's meaninglessness, unquote. White discusses two approaches to history, the beautiful and the sublime. Both Marxist and bourgeois historians are in the former group, attempting to find meaning in and learn from history. In this crux passage, White opts for the sublime approach, which sees our past as a meaningless spectacle. Rather than attempting to make sense of it and learn from it, we must rather do the Freudian move reaction formation, which involves an overcompensation in the opposite direction. So, we build our hopes for the future, our dignity and freedom, on a deliberate rejection of the horrors of the past and an arbitrary assertion that tomorrow will be as good as yesterday was disastrous. Of course, Freud didn't necessarily make this mega application of his concept, but a prominent intellectual of our day does. How much better our belief in history as his story and our hope based on a creation, fall, redemption plan of God rather than arbitrary and pathetic human assertion. One last note before we leave Freud. A prominent axiom of Freudianism has always been the Oedipal complex. We desire to kill our fathers and marry our mothers. One wonders where this leaves women, and is at best a perverse desire on the part of some fallen men. But note the Bible's answer to it, leaving and cleaving. In a stroke, the Bible transforms tragedy into divine wisdom and goodness. Men and women can in this way take their place beside their parents and parents-in-law as equal members of the body of Christ. Again, like all Bible doctrine, it is at once profound and profoundly practical. It works. If any of you or any group of you can finally lay the ghosts of Marx and Freud to rest, he will have removed two huge God substitutes from the 21st century. Another enormously influential movement active throughout the 20th and 21st centuries is feminism, gender studies, more recently queer theory, homosexual studies, their term of choice for its provocative in-your-face qualities. I would like to mention briefly one essay in this area. Get this. A Cyborg Manifesto, Science, Technology, and Socialist Feminism in the Late 20th Century by Donna Haraway. By the way, she also teaches in that same program in Santa Cruz. (laughs) Pretty wild. (laughs) Rather than emphasize binaries like male and female, black and white, hetero and homosexuality, that have tended to split us into smaller and smaller warring groups, uh, she sees hope in the fact that science and technology are erasing boundaries between human and animal, and even between organism and machine. A cyborg is, by definition, both organism and machine, and we are all becoming cyborgs. The old gender issues are thus becoming passe. She sees this development as a way of once and for all erasing all the old Genesis mythologies that have been productive of so much pain. This is her personal war against God. A few quotations. Quote, Unlike the hopes of Frankenstein's monster, The cyborg does not expect its father to save it through a restoration of the garden, that is, through the fabrication of a heterosexual mate. The cyborg does not dream of community on the model of the organic family. The cyborg would not recognize the Garden of Eden. It was not made of mud and cannot dream of returning to dust. Unquote. Uh, Quote, Biology and evolutionary theory over the last two centuries have reduced the line between humans and animals to a faint trace. Within this framework, Teaching modern Christian creationism should be fought as a form of child abuse, unquote. Perhaps Greek misogyny began when Zeus overthrew, overthrew the great goddess, but Donna Haraway ends her essay, I would rather be a cyborg than a goddess. Most of you know that I have a special interest in gender issues, and in my essay, Men and Women, I have attempted to answer, in part at least, writers like Donna Haraway, The fact that none of us are God does not mean that God does not exist. And the fact that none of us are perfect does not mean that God's design in creating us male and female is not perfect. Don't dismiss Donna Haraway as lunatic fringe. Her essay ends with a work cited that lists 126 items 
She is legion. Bear with me. We're almost done. If I can do it, you can do it, okay? (laughs) Some would see classical studies as a bulwark against modern and postmodern madness. Even, uh, indeed, even the German her- hermeneutical philosopher Hans Georg Gadamer put classical studies in a privileged position above the shifting sandbars of epistemological relativism. This, uh, there was a fascinating conference at Harvard not too many years ago in which some of our most celebrated classicists confronted the demons of deconstruction. An older term for classicist is philologist or a lover of words or language. Tolkien saw himself as a philologist. Our resident philologist is, of course, Dr. McRoberts. The work of a philologist is the restoration and interpretation of ancient texts. This is obviously of central importance to us as believers, since the restoration or preservation and interpretation of the Bible, both Old and New Testaments, falls within this circle. In this sense, Dr. Cox is also a philologist. In this conference, several Harvard philologists invited one bad boy from the outside a prominent deconstructive scholar, Jonathan Culler, from Cornell. Culler's talk was brilliant, entitled Anti-Foundational Philology, in which he argued that philology, though valuable, cannot give us ultimate truth or certainty. The contributions of the Harvard faculty were also brilliant, resourceful, and often angst-ridden. They clearly recognized that Culler spoke for an entire civilization, and some of the Harvard, Harvard professors, the younger ones, were with him almost completely. Some old classical titans resisted manfully. Stephen Owens answers one of these titans in this way. Quote, I would agree with Thomas that tossing all determinations back to the reader would be beyond the world of philology. But I frankly don't think people who make such a claim really mean what they say. Rather, I think the gesture is an attempt to find some grounding for the peculiar experience of not being able to come home securely to the word. When I say this, I have no intention at all of being nihilistic or pessimistic. I think it is simply a fallacy, and a remarkably odd fallacy at that, to assume that understanding more and better will mean that one's understanding is more secure. We have a choice between the pedagogical verity and philological doubt, and we will with all probability do a little of both. The philological disposition will not make us happier or make more obedient citizens of our students. I find it spiritually fortifying to articulate at least one eternal verity a day. But when I do, I always raise my eyes from the page. There is no doubt that philology looks for solid ground. But the very fact that it looks so intently for solid ground should tell you exactly where it is and where it is going. It is, my friends, criticism without a shore. And like it or not, we have already embarked, unquote. Let's unpack this briefly. Owen says that we can't simply, quote, toss all determinations back to the reader, unquote, and say with Humpty Dumpty that words and texts mean whatever anyone wants them to mean. But neither can philology give us certainty, security, or meaning. It cannot bring us securely home to the word. This is profound. Derrida faulted his mentor, Martin Heidegger, for the way in which he tried later in life to find refuge in a mystical understanding of poetry as some kind of homeland for the soul. Owens drives a wedge between teaching and scholarship, pedagogical verity and philological doubt. He affirms eternal verities before his students, but he must look up from the page when he does so. There is no solid ground, only criticism without a shore. What none of these Harvard scholars did, quite conspicuously, is attempt a thoroughly theocentric defense of language and interpretation. Such a defense might appeal first to the infinite perfect language spoken by the three persons of the Trinity to each other throughout all eternity. It might then consider the finite perfect language spoken between God and Adam and Adam and Eve before the fall. Going on to such topics as the finite imperfect language spoken by fallen man the confusion of language at Babel, the beginning of the redemption of language at the first Pentecost, the incarnational language of the Bible, inerrant and infallible, whose primary author is God and whose secondary authors are fallen humans. But the fact that language, along with all of creation, I'm sorry, and the fact that language, along with all of creation, will one day be perfectly redeemed and restored 
in the new heavens and the new earth. There is nothing wrong, in other words, with language per se, as it goes back before the creation and even before that existed eternally in God. It was one of God's greatest gifts to us and an an essential part of God's image in us. Only some such argument can answer color and Derrida behind him fully. Only in this way can scholarship undergird and enrich pedagogy. Any attempt to shore up philology or Western civilization short of whole-souled repentance and a return to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will fail in the end and be reduced to pathetic whining, to pitiful hand-wringing. We are classical Christians. Christian is the noun and classical the adjective. Classical studies on the foundation of Christian faith can take scholars to great heights, just as eros love on the foundation of God's agape love can take husbands and wives to great heights. In some grand sense, our culture has explored deeply both pride and despair in the last 500 years. Apart from repentance and faith, we will be gored by one or the other. Repentance delivers us from pride and faith from despair. We are now marking time, as Richter says. We are treading water. We need an idea and much more than an idea. I have prayed for years for a Christian renaissance and believe the time is ripe. I invite you to join me in this prayer. This renaissance, this rebirth of learning, must take place, pl- must take place within the context of revival, reformation, and renewal. We do not need Christian eggheads. We need humble and courageous believers who love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. The church was born in the midst of a jaded and sophisticated Roman Empire. In many ways, we have come full circle, and the church again finds herself facing a jaded and sophisticated world culture. Our culture is phony, trivial, and tawdry. The gospel is deep and real and true. May our contemporaries again say of us, see how they love one another. May it again be true of us that we triumph through outliving, outthinking, and outdying the pagan world around us. For the past several hundred years, the great books, the really big, seminal, culture-shaping books, have been written, for the most part, by radical unbelievers, men like Marx, Freud, and Nietzsche. You have to go all the way back to Luther, Calvin, Aquinas, and Augustine to find books of comparable influence written by godly men. Perhaps some of you sitting here today, or your children or grandchildren, will write books like this in the 21st century. We need to read the great books that we might write them. Our culture-shaping mission cannot be fully accomplished short of this, short of the gospel's deep, transforming work that puts to death both pride and despair. May we give ourselves to this in a thousand practical ways day by day, May we first show our neighbors what abundant life looks like. And we can do so with the same confidence of Daniel and his three friends. Because they understood all things in the light of God's word, and because they were deeply committed to following God no matter what, God enabled them to understand even Babylonian language and literature ten times better than did the Babylonians themselves. I have given you only a few contemporary examples of how foolish the world is and how wise our God. I have deliberately chosen the most luminous names of contemporary intellectual culture. May God bless us with courage, faith, and understanding, and enable us again to triumph like Daniel and his friends.